Jeff is quite possibly the most noble man I know. I'm gonna watch my <laughs> Jeff has taught me to focus on what matters most in life. <laughs> He's happy doing what he is doing. Yes. And I think that that makes us happy too. <laughs> when I first came to the village, I knew that sometime I was going to uh, fall in love, and I sure did. One of the things that uh, that he accomplished at the village that would have been very difficult was meeting his his special friend Becky, and uh, and this happened uh, about two years, I think, after they were riding the bus to church and met. And I kind of. <laughs> Fell head over heels. They have been, I think it's about 25 years now. They've been, been a, a couple for. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca is um, kind of um, cute and. A little bit um, feisty, but I kind of like that um, feistiness in her <clears throat> because in earlier years I was a little feisty my. So. Jeff and Becky wanted to go on vacation in Minnesota. And so they needed a male staff and a female staff to go with them. And I was asked to be the male staff with Jeff. And we went, we stayed in a motel. We went to the big malls. We went to Chanhassen Dinner Theater, went out to eat. And in retrospect, that may be the only vacation that Jeff and Becky ever really are able to experience together. And something that a lot of us take for granted, just to be able to go and stay in a motel and have a vacation. And this was just such a special, beautiful um, experience for them that I'm glad I was a part of and they were able to have. Was a, I just remember it was a nice afternoon in right downtown North Springs. He had just got a new motorcycle, which I didn't know him very well then. Came up Main Street at a wild rate of speed and didn't get stopped at the intersection. Hit a, uh, hit a truck um, coming down the highway right in front, right on Main Street. And it was a horrible accident and pronounced dead at the scene and, and uh, revived. And, and the things they said, we knew that he would never walk again and that he would never feed himself and that he would never, he wouldn't, he'd be blind. And we know Bill today, he just, he just came around. He came around because of his parents, because of his parents. How much we playing for you? Two bucks. Two bucks? Yeah. Well, then I, I knew Dick as long as my dad did, I suppose, because him and my dad were best friends. I'd go in and I'd say, hey, Dick, how you doing? And he'd say, hey, Buckwheat, that's the they'll have me a nickname as. Well, that nickname started from my dad. He called me that when I was just a tiny kid and it stuck. I'm just a good friend. And I said, Emery, what's going to happen if something happens to you? What will happen with Bill? And he said, don't worry, I've got it all taken care of. I have it all in the will and Betty and I have it all worked out. And it involved living at the farm the rest of his life. When Bill's dad went to the nursing home, I had a 
I had the come to Jesus thought that what am I going to do because I'm, I don't know if I want Bill living back out here by himself. I had already got him into the village routine. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. And when they discussed maybe bringing more residents out here, I didn't know how it was going to work. I am, I am exhausted worrying about Bill and worrying about his dad. I am just, I'm, I just can't, I'm exhausted. And then all of a sudden, this all came, this all came true. And Bill used words like sweet and things I hadn't heard him say. He is so excited to be back at the farm. When I found out I'm going to get to go back to my home, I was so overjoyed. I could, I was telling everyone, I'm getting to go back home. So it was a win-win for everyone. Bill got to come back to the farm. That first initial diagnosis when we were in Rochester, I cried the whole way home. I did too. The whole way home, I didn't even know what to do, what, where to turn. It was a horrible feeling. Um, it's you don't know where where to go, what to do next, and yeah, I, I lost a lot of time. It was really heart wrenching uh, to listen to her and the struggles that she had, and just the lack of knowledge she had when it came just to autism, but more importantly, wanting to help her son, but not knowing where to start at all. I couldn't hardly handle him. Yeah, he was out of control. I couldn't, I was literally at my wit's end. I didn't, I mean, you try to work with him on your own, you know, at home, but it just, it just and doesn't. You don't know what you're doing, it, yeah. I talked with her a lot about the evidence-based program that works for children with autism to try to just give her a basic understanding. And then once we got in here into the autism center, then I talked with her about how ways we could help Jordan, um, getting them on a waiver situation to give him a better outcome for when he was older. It's taken a lot of people to... Um, get him where he's at. Exactly. I'm not so sure that he would be in four-year-old four -year preschool right now. To be honest. Might not. Yeah, might not. You know, when I first met Stephanie, too, she was, you know, very tired, very weary, very lost, um, isolated, not knowing where to go. And I look at her now, and she's bright, and she's smiling, and she has hope in it. You can see the hope in her eyes. She knows that the diagnosis is still hard, but there is hope. There is hope to make Jordan's life the best that it can be. And that's all we could ever ask for with the autism. I didn't realize how many people needed the services and the relationships that the village provides. Not just the clients, but their families as well. It's a place of tremendous hope. If, if you're associated with the village, you just, you just, you've got it going on because there's no place like that. When he left home, he said he, he wanted to accomplish some things. He's done that.